Hello friends. Today I want to share with you a message called Counterfeit Christianity. Before I get into the message, this very important message, uh, I want to share some stats with you that to me, when I read them years ago, just blew my mind. Uh, so please listen closely to these stats as I read them off and take them into account. The Barner Research Group says that 62% of people in America claim to, have had, claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is meaningful to them. Let me say that again. The Barner Research Group says that 62% of people in America claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is meaningful to them. Now with that statistic in mind, contrast that stat to the ones I am about to read. According to the book, The Day America Told the Truth, 91% of Americans lie regularly at work or at home. 86% lie regularly to parents. And 75% lie regularly to friends. 90% of Americans own a Bible, but only 11% read it daily. According to a Roper Center poll, 61% of Americans believe that premarital sex is not morally wrong. A more recent Barner poll says that 1 out of 10 born-again Christians believe in reincarnation, which violates Christian tenets, and half of those quote-unquote born-again Christians who are polled believe that a person can earn salvation based on good deeds, even without trusting in Christ as the way to eternal life. It doesn't sound like these born-again Christians know how someone becomes born-again. So the question is, if, if a born-again Christian does not know how to become born-again, are they born again themselves? I don't think so. If there's anything in America that represents how much America has gone down the drain morally and spiritually, it's MTV, music television. Uh, it's just full of disgusting and filthy images, sexually immoral things, blasphemous things, things against Jesus Christ. Yet Barna surveyed evangelical teens and found that more evangelical teens watch MTV each week, 42%, than non-Christian teens, 33%. The Barner survey went on to say that of those evangelical teens that watch MTV, 65% said that they pray daily, 72% believed the Bible, 55% had had sex outside of marriage, 55% had cheated on an exam, and 20% had gotten drunk or used illegal drugs. Are you kidding me? Where is the difference? Where is the change? James 4.4 4 says, Do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Where is the difference between the Visible church, those who claim to be born-again evangelical Christians, where's the difference between them and the world? 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The people mentioned in these stats sure sound like they are friends with the world, doesn't it? In fact, to go a step further, they sound just like the world. Not just friends, but just like them. They definitely don't act like Christians. That is for sure. We must remember in this day and age that we can't take people's word anymore when they say, I'm a Christian. We must check what they say. Just because they say they're a Christian doesn't mean they really are a Christian. People aren't Christians because they have a cross around their neck. Or because they have a Jesus bumper sticker on their car. They're not a Christian because they go to a building one, two, or three times a week that they call a church. They aren't a Christian just because they dipped in some water and are baptized. That doesn't make someone a Christian. Now listen to these stats. In March, April 1993, the publication called American Horizon disclosed the fact that in 1991... 11,500 churches of a major U.S. denomination had obtained 294,784 decisions for Christ. Unfortunately, they could find only 14,337 in fellowship. They couldn't account for 280,000 of their decisions. 
And all of this happened despite the usual intense follow-up program afterwards. Charles E. Hackett, the National Director for the Division of Home Missions for a leading U.S. denomination, once said, A soul at the altar does not generate much excitement in some circles because we realize approximately 95 out of every 100 will not become integrated into the church. In fact, most of them will not return for a second visit. There's something wrong with that, friends. In 1991, organizers of a Salt Lake City Christian concert encouraged follow-up with those who responded to the altar calls at their, at their concert. They said less than 5% of those who respond to an altar call during a public crusade are living a Christian life one year later. One mass crusade reported 18,000 decisions for Christ. Yet according to Church Growth Magazine, 94% of these decisions failed to become incorporated into a local church. All I can say, friends, is wow. The statistics don't lie. These stats are the truth, whether you want to believe them or not. And let me make a very bold statement right from the start. There are many people, many people who claim to be Christians, who say that they're on their way to heaven, who say they have forgiveness of sin, that they're evangelical, they're born again, but they really aren't. Let me say that again. There are many people who say they're Christians, born again, evangelical, that go to church, that have been baptized, that, that's claimed to be born again, Yet they are not Christians. They are not a part of the kingdom of God. They are not really born again. Yet they are on their way to hell. Yet they think they've escaped the flames of hell. Their sins are not forgiven. But they think their sins are forgiven. Isn't that a scary thought? To think you're a Christian. To think you've escaped the flames of hell. But you really haven't? Dangerous. It's called. It's one of the most dangerous things in the world of history. It's called self-deception or self-delusion. It's probably one of the most dangerous things in all of life. As I said, the teaching I'm about to share with you is called Counterfeit Christianity. And this teaching has two primary purposes in mind. One, to expose those people who say or think that they are Christians, and they really aren't. This is done so that each counterfeit Christian can come to a knowledge of the truth and finally become a genuine born-again Christian. Modern day Christianity says, pray this little prayer just once and you're a Christian. It's all God requires of you. It's a genuine moment of faith sometime in the past. But the Bible says something altogether different. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? You need to examine yourself as you listen to this message today. Not someone else. Don't think about your friend or this person or that person. You need to think about yourself and examine yourself during this message. And the second primary purpose for this teaching is for those who truly are saved, are born again Christians, and who want to share the gospel of the lost, to clarify to them what the gospel message they should be sharing, what it is, what the biblical gospel is. And let me just say this right off the bat. If you are a Christian, if you are a child of God who has eternal life and the forgiveness of sins and you're born again, you have an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you should have a desire to share the gospel. If you don't, there's something terribly wrong. Because for you to have eternal life, the greatest gift there is in the world, and to hold it to yourself and not want to share it with others, that's one of the most selfish things that someone can do. So I admonish you, if you proclaim to be a Christian, and you don't, want to, you don't have no desire to share the gospel. You need to check yourself. You need to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And if you think you are in the faith, you need to cry out to God to, to warm up your cold heart, to melt your, your heart of stone, and to give you a strong desire, the desires he has to see the lost saved, to give you that same desire. But the, the second uh, primary purpose is very important because if we are out sharing the gospel, we're sharing the wrong gospel, the wrong message. What we're going to do is create more counterfeit Christians. We're going to create more people who are going to fit into the stats I read earlier in this teaching. And we don't want to do that, friends. There's enough professing Christians in the world who are giving Jesus Christ, the church, and Christianity a bad name. And we don't need any more. So we don't need any more counterfeit Christians. Uh, there's millions already. Uh, so God forbid we give people who are on their way to hell a false hope that they're Christians are on their way to heaven when they aren't. It'd be like telling a blind man who's walking towards the, end of the edge of the Grand Canyon, Oh, you're okay, no big deal, keep walking, you're on a safe path. 
and he falls off the cliff. And how much worse is it to tell someone they're on their way to heaven, that they have eternal life, they're going to be part of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, and, and eternity, but yet they're on their way to hell. God forbid. So, first thing I want, I want you to ask yourself is, why, why all these stats at the beginning of this, of this, this teaching? Well, the world, sh the world should be different than the church. The church should be different than the world. And as I read off James 4.4 4 and 1 John 2.15, it makes it very clear, and there's lots of other scriptures I can share as well, that Christians are supposed to be different from the world, separate from the world. The old saying of in the world, but not of the world, is true, for the Bible teaches. And, but what is, what is being preached, for the most part, in American churches these days, are they preaching the biblical gospel? And see, this is one of the, the major problems I see with why we have these kind of stats. It's for the most part, here in America, and even abroad, and in and, and, and the world, that the biblical gospel is not being preached. So it's producing these kind of counterfeit Christians. The gospel that uh, you see Jesus preaching, and Peter, and Paul, and John, and the arrested apostles, and the early church preaching is rarely ever preached anymore. The gospel that men like George Fox, and John Wesley, and Charles Finney, and Peter Cartwright, and A.W. Tozer, and Lennon Ravenhill, what they preach is rarely ever preached in America anymore. So what the first thing I want to do uh, today is take a look at, at some Gospels that really are not Gospels at all because Gospel means good news. They're really bad news for the sinner who hears these things because they're false Gospels. Okay, so let's take a look at the, at the first uh, Gospel that's being preached. It's producing these counterfeit kind of Christians in the world. It's called the Hellfire and Brimstone Only Gospel. It goes something like this. Turn or burn, you wicked, evil, sinful people, you're going to hell. And that's it. Now, those things, saying those things in themselves are not wrong. I say those things when I preach in the open air. But saying those things alone, and not opening, offering the sinners who are hearing the message hope or a solution to their problem, is wrong. It's, an, it's a half gospel. So even though the hellfire and brimstone message is true, it is missing a very essential message, a very essential part of the message. This type of gospel is, of course, void of the love of God and the grace of God and of Christ crucified for the remission of sins. In fact, those things never come up in this kind of gospel message. And as you listen to the people who preach this kind of gospel, they seem to be void of the love of God themselves. They seem to have forgotten that God is ours for none to perish, but for all to have eternal life. They seem to have forgotten where they have come from, that they were once wicked, sinful people themselves in need of eternal life. And the group of people that really come to mind when I think about this gospel is the Westboro Baptist Church. They go around telling everyone that they're going to hell and never preach about the cross or the love and mercy of God to the sinners who hear them preach. When it seems to me that they are the ones, this is an ironic thing, and telling other people they're going to hell, it seems that they are the ones, and to me, that are actually on their way to hell. They and others like them forget that Christ died for all people, and not just for them. They seem to, like I said, also forgot where they have come from, that they were once sinful people. They seem to believe that they were always saved, or something like that. And as I said, the cross is never even mentioned in this gospel either. Even though the Apostle, Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 2 said, I have, a, I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The hellfire brimstone only preacher has forgotten what the word gospel even means. It means good news. And again, I have no problem with preaching the bad news. That's very essential either. Um, and if you don't preach the bad news along with the good news, you're preaching a half gospel too. So whether you're just preaching the bad news or you're just preaching the good news, you're preaching a half truth and a half truth is a whole lie. Um, now, there are, there are exceptions to this, that, that maybe you're preaching open air and people are walking by, and all they're hearing is the, the bad news part. You can't do anything about that. And there may be some times where you have an audience you're preaching to in the open air, or you're sharing with one-to-one -one or in small groups, that they need to hear more of the hellfire and brimstone and the hell and judgment and, and sin and righteousness than of grace, mercy, cross, and, and forgiveness. Uh, so there, there are times when your audience will determine which part of the message you focus on more than the other. And, uh, you know, so that will determine it. So if someone is humble and they're, they've broken over their sin, you give them grace, mercy, and the cross. If they're prideful and they, they, they think they're a good person when they're not, then you give them more 
hellfire, brimstone, and judgment, and sin. But if you never get to the good news, then you didn't preach the gospel. The whole point in preaching the bad news that is not to leave them helpless or hopeless or on their way to hell. The whole pr point in preaching the bad news is to get to the good news. So they can see that they have hope. They can see they have help. So after they felt the full burden of their sin, they, felt, they feel the hopelessness and helplessness within, you give them the hope, the help that they need. The thing that will lift their burden, the Lord Jesus Christ. To leave them with hope and help that is found in Jesus Christ, who died for their sins, was buried and rose from the grave three days later, defeating sin and death. So that's the first uh, false gospel that produces counterfeit Christians, because people think that God has no love for them. They think all he wants to do is smash them on the head with a big sledgehammer and send them to hell. Well, it's not true. God has a benevolent love for them. He desires the greatest good for them. He wants them to be saved. As Romans 5 says, God demonstrates his love toward us, and while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's what we see in the Bible. So if there's two parts here. There's good news and bad. We must share both with people. And the second false gospel is the gospel that goes like this. Just ask Jesus into your heart. Or, you have a God-shaped hole in your, your heart that only God can fill. Now, contrary to popular opinion, neither of these statements or concepts are found anywhere in the Bible. The only hint we see of either is found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. But that verse isn't even written to unbelievers. It is Jesus Christ speaking to the church at Laodicea. So how do we go from that... Jesus Christ preaching, teaching to, or talking to the church later to see it, to being a gospel message that we share with unbelievers. I don't know how or when it went to that, but that's not a gospel message. The problem with this gospel is that people get some kind of false misconception that because they've asked Jesus in their heart, or uh, that they are forgiven of their sins, or that they have escaped the flames of hell. Not true. In this gospel, there's no mention of repentance or confession or forsaking sin. There's no mention of being born again and what that means. There's no mention of hell or judgment day. There's no mention of a holy and just God who will call all to give an account of every thought, word, and deed. There's no mention of counting the cost. No mention of how a Christian is supposed to live after conversion. Holy. Holy is the way Christians are supposed to live after conversion. This gospel is a grace I say grace, it's not a real grace, a grace in love only gospel. But a grace that allows license to sin is no grace at all. The grace of God, the true grace of God from the Bible, changes people. For someone to abuse the grace of God and use it as a license to sin is to reveal their true self, that they are no Christian at all. In fact, there is a passage of scripture in the Bible that tells us what true grace is and how someone who has grace will act. From Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 14, it says, For the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So you have to ask yourself, friend, do you truly have the grace of God according to the Bible? Are you being taught by God to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age? Are you looking forward to Christ coming back as a bride walking down the aisle to the groom to be wed to, to each other? Are, are you being purified? Are you zealous for good works? If those things can't be said about you, friends, then no matter what your pastor or preacher or what you've heard about this, you don't have the grace of God according to the Bible. So please, friends, examine your own heart today to see if you really have the grace of God. In this gospel is also no mention of what is found in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. It says, When he, Jesus, had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will a profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
Forever is ashamed of me and my words, and this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him the Son of Man also be ashamed, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I call this passage of scripture, Christianity in a nutshell. Whoever desires to come after me, Jesus said, whoever desires to be my disciple, to be a follower of me, a learner of me, is open to anyone. But here's the conditions. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him lose his life. Let him lay his life down for me, Jesus said, and the gospel. Those are the conditions to being a Christian. That's what a Christian will do. Not might do. This is the way a Christian will live. And true Christians won't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're willing to sacrifice all for Jesus in the gospel. But sadly, in my experience, about 95% of the time, this isn't the type of Christian that asks Jesus into your heart that this gospel produces. The ask Jesus into your heart gospel usually doesn't produce people who are willing to die for Christ either. But we must be willing to die for him. He gave his all for us, and we, how can we hold anything back from him? How can we not give our all back to him? Let me ask you this question. If this country was suddenly taken over by Muslims and made into an Islamic, er, Islamic republic, where Sharia law ruled the land, where Christianity was outlawed, and you faced the possibility of death or denying Christ, what would you choose? Would you deny Christ if you were faced with losing your life? Or would you lose your life for his sake and the Gospels and hold on and cling to Christ in the cross? and die for his sake. We must be willing to die for Christ. But even more than that, let's be doing something that's even more important, that's even harder to do in my opinion, and that's to live for him each and every day. Every moment of every day. You see, because dying for him happens in a moment of time. But living for him is a moment by moment thing. We must not be hypocrites, friends. Every thought, every word, every action for the glory of God alone. Every moment of every day. He must be our all in all. He must be that precious pearl that we sold everything to buy. But for the people who hear this gospel, the ask Jesus into your heart gospel, or you have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only, God, that only uh, Christ can fill, Jesus usually becomes more of an additive to life than a new master and focus in life. He's not first and foremost, but an afterthought. Christ isn't the center of all their affections. He's an afterthought. He's the world, the sin, and things are the center of their affections and the center of their world. He is a Sunday and Wednesday social gathering for most people who hear this gospel and believe it, and nothing else. And when we preach or share a gospel such as Acts, Jesus, in your heart, or you have a God shape holding your heart only God can fill, we are doing the people we share it with a great disservice. We are giving them a false hope. We are leading them to believe that they are saved by asking Jesus in their heart. But where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible ever say that? Does this mean, of course, that, that every person who asks Jesus in their heart, that they're, that they're not saved? Well, no, of course not. Because people who have asked Jesus in their heart, who have asked God to come fill that God-shaped hole in their heart that only He can fill, some of them have, are saved and have been saved, but they weren't saved because they asked Jesus in their heart. They weren't saved because... They asked him to fill the hole in the heart that only he could fill. They were saved because they repented of their sins, they trusted in Christ, and they began to live a life that's pleasing to him. There's a man named A.W. Tozer who had much to say about the issue of being truly born again or not. He was a preacher and writer during the middle of the 1900s and was a mentor to Leonard Ravenhill. Listen to what A.W. Tozer said about becoming a Christian. The whole transaction of religious conversion had been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith may now be exercised without a jar to the moral life. Christ may be received without creating any special love for him in the soul of the receiver. The man is saved, but he is not hungry or thirsty after God. In fact, he specifically taught to be satisfied and encouraged to be content with very little. Very thought-provoking quote from Tozer. Listen to one more from him. The idea that God will pardon a rebel who has not given up his rebellion is contrary both to the scriptures and to common sense. How horrible to contemplate a church full of persons who have been pardoned but still love sin and hate the ways of righteousness. And how much more horrible to think of heaven as filled with sinners who had not repented nor changed their way of living. Do you know what one of the main fruits of a counterfeit Christian is? They only change in public. 
They only change in front of people. They're, they're not the same person in public that they are at home or in private. And when it comes down to it, friends, they really don't live the Christian life at all. Is that you? Are you a Christian in public? Or a Christian in private, too? They only live in front of people whom they want to think that they are a Christian. And that's what most of American Christianity is days. It's a farce. It's merely it's a farce. It's merely a mask that people hide their hypocrisy behind. And you know what the Bible says about hypocrites, right? What does the Bible say about hypocrites? They're going to hell. Are you a hypocrite? You need to repent, friends. You need to get right with God. Christianity is not about going to a building or about uh, praying a prayer or about getting dipped dip in water, although those things may be part of it. It's about living for Jesus Christ and knowing Him intimately, spending time with Him each and every day, and having an intimate relationship with the God of the universe through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. So the second false gospel, the exegesis to your heart gospel, or your God's hole in your heart gospel, is no gospel at all either, as well as the hellfire and brimstone only gospel. The third false gospel is called the incentive gospel. This gospel goes like this. Come to Jesus, and he will give you peace, joy, happiness, purpose, and fulfillment in life. Or it might even go like this. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Of course, these things are true for those who have truly become Christians. I mean, how many Christians have experienced joy and purpose and fulfillment in life? I know I have. I know I, I love my, It's a wonderful life to me. But my perspective is different than the perspective of the lost sinner when it comes to these things. but we And these are the fruits of the Christian life. But we can't use the fruits of salvation, peace, joy, purpose, and fulfillment in life, as a drawing card to get someone saved, because that's not biblical. You don't use the fruits of salvation to get someone to come to salvation. First of all, the terms wonderful, peace, joy, purpose, and fulfillment are very relative terms. It all depends on who you're talking about. Like I said, for me, it's different than for the non-Christian. When we as Christians think about something that's wonderful, it's quite opposite of what the person who isn't a Christian thinks is wonderful. In fact, if you were to ask a non-Christian what the saying, God has a wonderful plan for your life, means, they might say something like this. That it means they'll have a good job, lots of money, a spouse with a perfect body, a nice car, a big house, no bills, and that they will be completely healthy physically. But as Christians, we know that's not what we mean when we say, God has a wonderful plan for your life. So for us to share it with them is to miscommunicate things to them and to give them a false hope once again. At least I hope if you're a Christian that's not what you think a wonderful plan for your life means. If that is what you think, there's something desperately wrong. Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. He didn't even own a home. He, he stayed at home, but he didn't have a home for himself. He didn't have nice cars. He wasn't rich. He didn't have nice clothes. He didn't have those things. But he had a wonderful life because he's walking in the will of the Father. It's definitely what, what the apostles would have thought it meant either when they thought wonderful plan for life. All of the apostles, except for one, John, were martyred for their faith. And it wasn't for a lack of them trying to kill John either. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. Bartholomew, reportedly, was skinned alive and crucified, yet he kept preaching the gospel to passersby, so they finally cut his head off to get him to shut up. And there had been more Christians martyred since the beginning of the 20th century, 1900 than the rest of history combined. Christians are brutally killed and horribly tortured all around the world every day. Yet most of the Christians of America are living their nice little American dream and don't think a second thought about their brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are being tortured and beaten and bruised and killed for the name of Jesus Christ. When a non-Christian thinks of God having a wonderful plan for a life, these, these are not the things they are thinking about. We tell non-believers, God has a wonderful plan for life, or, or, or come to Christ for peace, love, happiness, purpose, and fulfillment in life. They think that God is some glorified Walmart in heaven, where they can just call upon whatever they want, think whatever they want. Just fold their hands, close their eyes, go to checkout, and bam! God's given them whatever they want. That's not what God is like. God is, God is seen to them as a means to an end, not the end in itself. He is the end. He is the one we bring glory to. Not a means to get what you want. They want to use God instead of becoming used by Him as being His bondservant. 
Anything that Jesus Christ, some exalted Santa, that will give them whatever brings them pleasure. Just write him a little list. As long as you're a good boy or girl, you'll get whatever you want from him. Yet as Christians, we know these things are not true. Think about this question for a second. Could we preach this incentive gospel to people who are living in a third world country or to people who live in a place where Christians are persecuted for their faith? Of course not. Of course we couldn't. And the model I like to use to judge any gospel message that any Christian preacher preaches is this. If it can't be preached to everyone, everywhere, then it shouldn't be preached to anyone, anywhere. Let me say that again. If the gospel you preach, or you share, can't be preached to everyone, everywhere, then it shouldn't be preached to anyone, anywhere. We should be preaching the same gospel no matter where we go in life. Like I said, your focus might be different on the bad news or good news depending on your audience, but the content of the message will be the same everywhere we go. Because the gospel is and should be good news to everyone, everywhere. And it is good news to everyone, everywhere, if it is preached the right way. That doesn't mean that we'll all, they will all accept it or obey it or that they'll like it, but it means it'll be biblical. It'll be truly good news whether they think it is or not. So the third false gospel, the incentive gospel, must be tossed out the window. It's not biblical. It doesn't produce the converts that the Bible says true converts will be. It must be thrown away. So we've had three false gospels so far. The hellfire and brimstone only gospel. Um, the ex, the uh, ex Jesus in your heart gospel. Or a God has a, you have a God-shaped hole in your heart gospel. And then there's the incentive gospel. And finally, the fourth uh, false gospel is the sinner's prayer, or pray this little prayer after me. Now this is found nowhere in the Bible. Where does the Bible ever tell us to uh, get someone to pray a prayer after us to get them saved? Uh, where does it even come close to doing such a thing? I don't know when it was introduced to Christianity, but I never lead someone in what is commonly called the sinner's prayer. Why do we believe that getting someone to say a prayer will save them? Where's that found in the Bible? It's like Harry Potter Christianity. Abracadabra, a little magic spell, and poof, you're a Christian. No, that's not the way Christianity works. When I was in uh, Nashville, North Carolina, preaching the gospel three or four years ago at a festival called Belshare, uh, some of my friends of mine went into a local church that was, that was near the fair, and they allowed us to come in there and get refreshments and sit down at their tables and chairs and and use their restrooms to kind of, you know, get relaxed for a while. We're out there all day preaching the gospel, and we really appreciated that. But while we were there, a lady who goes to that church brought in two homeless guys uh, and asked them who they thought Jesus was. And this, we, this was the response from two homeless guys. One thought he was a good man, and the other thought he was just a prophet. She said, and this is what she said to them in response to that, Well, he can be more than that to the two of you today. And then she proceeded to lead them in the sinner's prayer. And for some reason, she thinks it's going to help them or make them a Christian. I don't know what she was thinking. But this is a common thing in Christianity. And let me just give you an analogy so you can better understand where I'm coming from and why I won't ever lead a sinner in what is called the sinner's prayer anymore. Okay, so we have this a husband and a wife and a pastor. Now the husband, and the husband and wife are claiming to be Christians, the husband has fallen into sin. He's chosen to cheat on his wife. He's done it one time. He does it another time. He's done it like three or four times now. So the husband and wife come to me uh, as a pastor for counseling. And the husband says, uh, you know, I really want to I, I want to do better, pastor. And the wife says, well, I, I'm willing to accept him as long as he makes a decision not to do this anymore. And he has a heartfelt apology to me. So I asked, I asked the wife, well, can you leave the room for a second? She's like, yeah, sure. I'm talking to the husband one and one. He says, well, I don't, I don't know what to say to her. I said, well, um, let me just write it out for you here. And I write out, the, I write out the, uh, the apology for him, exactly what he should say. I tell his wife to come back in. He turns around and looks at his wife, and there's no tears in his eyes. There's no heartfelt sorrow in his voice. And he says to his wife, and he just reads off the apology word for word as he's looking at her. And reading off. Now, is she going to think that he's really sorry? I mean, I, I wrote out the apology for him. There's no brokenness in his voice. There's no... Heart felt sorrow for what he did. Not even for getting caught. There's no even, any sorrow for that. And um, so she's not going to think he's sorry. So with this analogy in mind, I find it very hard to use a sinner's prayer anymore. 
Because if the sinner is, is really wants to become a Christian, they'll be broken over their sin. There'll be some contrition there. Uh, they'll be, have godly sorrow that leads to repentance. They'll want to stop their sinning. And I don't have to tell them the words to say. God's not looking for certain words from the say. He's looking for a heartfelt sorrow, a godly sorrow, a brokenness, a contrition over their sin, a, a willingness to never sin again, and, and, and just pouring out their heart to God. God's not looking for certain words. He's looking for sorrow in their heart. He's looking for someone to yield their whole life to Him, no matter what the cost to them. And usually I will tell someone who, who seems willing to repent and trust in Christ to cry out to God for mercy. To confess and forsake all sin, all known sin, and surrender their whole life to Christ. To repent, believe, and be baptized. And in all reality, that is what this sinner's prayer has done, it's, or, or praying to be saved has done, is taking the place of baptism. Biblical baptism. And in place of someone repenting, trusting, and getting baptized immediately... Not waiting until the quarterly baptism or to when it's convenient for the pastor. Um, and getting doing it right away and doing it in front of many people. They, they make someone wait and, and tell them to pray a prayer after them instead. But this doesn't mean anything. They, they need to cry out to God, that's right. They need to confess their sins, repent of their sins. But praying a prayer after someone is not the biblical mandate. The biblical mandate, the gospel is simple. Repent of your sins. Turn in faith to Jesus Christ as the only person who can save you, get baptized, and then persevere to the end, living a life of holiness. That's the biblical gospel. But many people who pray the sinner's prayer or ask Jesus in the heart are simply accepting the intellectual or doctrinal facts about him. That doesn't mean anything if there isn't a true heart change in their life, though. People can accept some intellectual facts about Jesus and still miss heaven by a inches because their heart wasn't involved in the situation. They haven't truly accepted Christ. They accept Him intellectually, but they haven't truly repented of their sins and surrendered their whole life to Him. Leonard Ravenhill once said this, We have an all-time high in church attendance with a corresponding all-time low in spirituality. He also said, There is a world of difference between knowing the Word of God, the Scriptures, and knowing the God of the Word. Now, do you see why these Gospels are no Gospels at all? They lead people to have a false hope. And a false hope is not good news, is it? But where will these people be someday if they haven't truly repented of their sins and turned in faith to Jesus Christ? They'll be in hell. Even though they thought they were on their way to be a part of the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Now, this isn't by any means an exhaustive list of all the false Gospels, but I believe these are the most prevalent ones in modern-day American Christianity. And these Gospels are the main reason, in my mind, that we have so many counterfeit Christians here in America. And as I've already said, this doesn't mean that people haven't gotten saved through these, these false Gospels before, or people won't continue to get saved through these Gospels. But the question is, are these Gospels biblical representations of the true Gospels as found in the Bible? And I would say with a resounding, no, they are not. And just because there have been people who have gotten saved through these Gospels, and that there's been success through these Gospels, does not mean we should continue to share these Gospels for pragmatic reasons. Let me give you an analogy to help you understand. Let's just take, the, let's say there's two parachute riggers, okay? And they each have a hundred parachutes to put together. And the first guy gets a hundred together real quick, as quick as he can, and he's done it in about 15 minutes. The next guy takes his time on each one, does it according to the instruction manual, the book, is making sure he's checking himself here and there, he's making sure he's doing every step right, and it takes him a whole day to do 100 parachutes. Now they, now these parachuters, or these people who are going to be dropping out of airplanes, the skydivers, they're going to put these parachutes on, and, and the 100 from the first group, 5 make it to the ground safely, the other 95 die. Their parachutes are open properly. And 95 out of 100 of them die. The second 100, they all make it to the ground safely. Every once in a while, maybe one won't make it to the ground so they'll break their leg because they have some problem with the parachute. But do you see my point? Just be, When you see the 95 out of the 100 who are dying on their way out of the airplane, down from the plane to the ground, you don't look at the five and say, look at the five. Look, five, five made it safely to the ground. I should keep on doing it. I'm successful with my parachute. I should keep on doing that. No, you look at 95 and say, there's a problem here. 
This guy over here did 199 or 100 out of 100 making it to the ground safely. Maybe we should look at his success rate and do what he said, do what he's doing. Follow the instruction book. And when it comes to preaching the biblical gospel, we can't share these gospels just because people have gotten saved and passed through them. Doesn't mean we should keep on sharing them again in the future. Just because there's been some success. But look, look at all these stats I read and what these gospels are producing in our society. It's producing a, a hypocritical Christianity. Not genuine Christianity. It's producing counterfeit Christianity. Not genuine Christianity. If the gospel really is the power of God on the salvation, like the Bible says it is, do we need to change it? Do we need to soften up because we might offend someone? Or is the gospel of repentance, faith, and be baptized that is found in the Bible good enough to save lost sinners from their sins, from the wrath of God, and from hell? Is it still good enough for us? I mean, if Jesus our Lord preached repentance and faith, and then has disciples baptize his converts. Do we need to change it? If John the Baptist, who Jesus called the greatest man born among women, preached repentance and faith and baptized his converts, should we preach something other than that? Should we change his message? If the apostles, whom Christ personally chose, preached repentance and faith and then baptized their converts, is that message good enough for us? I'd say yes. Why then, as most American Christianity changed the biblical gospel into Acts Jesus in your heart, Pray this prayer to me. God's a wonderful plan for your life. Uh, come to God for this, that, this, and that. The hellfire and brimstone only gospel. Why have we changed it into these things? We need to rethink our message to make sure it is biblical. We need to make sure it's biblical. Some may be wondering what my scripture support is for saying that a person can be self-deceived or, or self-deluded at the beginning of this teaching. That someone could think that they are a Christian and not really be one. Well, I've touched on and mentioned some scriptures already uh, here and there, but let me go to the main scripture I'm going to use for this doctrine called counterfeit Christians. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is possibly one of the scariest portions of scripture found in the Bible. I mean, just take a look at it. These people who Jesus is referring to, who are saying these things to him on that jud on judgment day, aren't atheists. They aren't pagans. They aren't Jews. They aren't Muslims. They aren't Satanists. They aren't Buddhists. They aren't Hindus. These people thought they were Christians. They called Jesus Lord. They didn't just call him Savior. They called him Lord. And they went a step further. They called him Lord, Lord. And when someone says Lord, Lord, it is a, a spirit of intense zeal and and to demonstrate the strength of their devotion and dedication, supposed dedication, supposed devotion to the Lord. Then in verse 22, they, they say, In your name. And it was used three times in order to emphasize the per supposed personal connection to Jesus Christ. So the person, or the persons, the people spoken of in this, this passage, are clearly people who professed faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. But that's where it stopped. That's where it stopped. They professed that Jesus was the Lord, but it wasn't true. They professed to have eternal life, but they did not possess it. They professed it, but they did not possess it. Just look at all the great things they supposedly did in Jesus' name. They prophesied, which could be foretelling the future, or could just be preaching the Word of God. And I've personally uh, known pastors who have come to the knowledge and the truth that they are counterfeit Christians, and they finally repent and become truly born again. I've known pastors who are like that. And I'm sure that there are many other pastors who really are not children of God, but say they are. The people spoken of in this passage are also claim to cast out demons in Jesus' name, to have performed many miracles in his name as well. Now, did these people really cast a demon and, and perform miracles in Jesus' name? I doubt it, but they're claiming to do it. That's the point. And, but just because someone claims to do religious things in the name of Jesus, or claim that he is their Lord, and that they do things in his name, does not make them one of his followers. It does not mean they're part of the kingdom of heaven. It does not mean that they're born again. It does not mean that they're children of God. Saying a little prayer, asking Jesus in your heart, getting baptized, or going to church, don't make you a Christian. And preaching, prophesying, casting out demons, and doing miracles, supposedly, doesn't make you a Christian either. Now, if you are a Christian, you will get baptized, you will fellowship with other believers, you will pray, etc. But doing religious things in and of themselves does not make someone a Christian. So what, so what did Jesus say to these people 
in the end, who supposedly uh, knew him as Lord. He said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now there's two reasons he just gave why he tells these people to depart from The first one is this, he never knew them. The word translated as new here is in, in this verse is the Greek word gnosko. Now the Greek word gnosko means to know something or someone experientially or intimately. There are other Greek words that could have been used that, that would have uh, meant to know about someone or know about something, but those words weren't used. So this verse isn't saying that Jesus doesn't know about you or me. In fact, he knows all about you and me. He knows the very hairs in our head. He knows everything that he could possibly be known about our lives. But what this verse is saying is that he doesn't know these people experientially or intimately, and that he's never known them in such a way. They've never had an experience with Jesus Christ. They've never had a supernatural born-again experience. They haven't been born from above. They don't have eternal life. And what is eternal life according to scriptures? Well, Jesus makes it clear in John 17, 3. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. But the people spoken of in Matthew 7 are merely religious. They do works in his name and think they belong to him, but they don't. They have a misunderstanding as to how someone becomes a Christian. And they don't get what it means to have eternal life. It means to have a deep, abiding relationship with the God of the universe. It isn't just about doing things, per se. It is knowing Him, as John 17, 3. And what will flow from that is the doing things. Being a Christian is what John 15 talks about. It's about abiding in Him, in Jesus Christ, and through that abiding relationship, producing much fruit for the glory of God. 1 John 2, 3-5 says this, Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, on himself also to walk, just as he walked. So you, me, and every other professing Christian in the world can know that we know him, and can know if others know him, can know that we are in him, can know that others are in him, if we and them Keep his commandments. We know that we are abiding in him if we walk just as he walked. So the obedience is required if you're a Christian. Obedience is not optional. There aren't different levels to Christianity where there's a disobedient Christian than the obedient Christian. No, it's only obedient Christians. That brings me to the second reason why Jesus said, depart from me. He said these people practiced lawlessness. Well, what is lawlessness? It's the breaking of God's commands. It's going against what God commands you to do. And it's living, thinking, and saying contrary to how God would have you to live, think, and talk. Simply put, it's living a life of sin. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through chapter 7, verse 1 says. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God Almighty commands us to come out from among the world and to be separate, to live a life of holiness where we are cleansed from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Solomon, at the end of his life, put it like this in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We are to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is our all. For he will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said it like this in James 1.22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James goes on to say in James 10, 2, verses 17 through 20, this also, by, this also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. 
Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. You prove your faith by your works. If you say you have faith but have no works, you have a dead faith, and that faith will not save you. All it will do is cast you into hell in the end. You'll be one of those ones who Jesus says, apart from it. You work of iniquity. You one who practices lawlessness. And I can go on to many other scriptures regarding this issue. But the point is that someone who is truly born again, born from above, born of the Spirit of God, saved, whatever other name you want to give it, will prove that they are Christian by not living in sin. God forbid, just because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, that we use that grace as a license to sin. The Bible makes it clear that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. And the, the pure in heart are the ones who will see God. Matthew 5, 8. Charles Finney once said, The individual who truly repents, not only confesses sin as detestable and vile and worthy of abhorrence, but he really abhors it and hates it in his heart. A person may acknowledge sin as hurtful and abominable, while his heart loves it, desires it, and clings to it. When he truly repents, he most heartily renounces it. Have you truly repented, friends? Do you utterly hate and abhor sin? Examine yourself today, friends. Your very soul depends on it. If you're to look at your, your life as a whole, since you say you have become a Christian, is there a change? Is there a drastic change? Is there a hunger for the Word of God and for prayer, for communion with God? Is there a desire for more of God and less of you? Are the fruits of the Spirit evident in your life? Are the fruits of the Spirit evident in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Do you have those things in an increasing measure in your life? Do you desire to see the lost saved? If you don't have those desires, if there isn't a drastic change, if you don't hate sin, then there's probably something wrong, friends. In the end, the Bible makes it clear that those who are truly His are chains. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, The solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. According to Romans 6, we are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. And if we are no longer slaves to sin, we no longer obey in this lust. If this isn't enough to convince anyone, then read the, the whole book of 1 John, or read Hebrews, or read Romans 6. 1 John 5.13 says, These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants us to know. He does not want us to be self-deceived or eluded, friends. We must, we must see ourselves in truth. We must be honest with ourselves. And we must deal with ourselves if something is wrong. We must. This message requires a response from you, friends. Remember, this message had two purposes in mind. One, to expose those who think they are Christians and they really aren't. Are you truly a Christian friend according to the Word of God? Do you truly have the grace of God according to Titus 2, 11 through 14? Friends, if you aren't a biblical Christian, then don't let your pride get in the way of you truly becoming one. Become one today. Today is the day of salvation. Repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ today, and He'll make you born again. He'll give you a new heart and new desires. Desires to do what He wants to do instead of what you want to do. Then get baptized in the public profession of faith and in a step of first obedience to Jesus Christ. And the second purpose was this. For those who are saved and want to seek to save that which is lost, it clarifies the true gospel for them. And I hope the gospel has become clearer to you today. I hope you have seen that repentance, faith, and baptism followed by a life of good works and holiness unto God, self-denial, taking up the cross, following Jesus Christ and persevering to the end is a biblical gospel. We must get the gospel right. We don't want any more counted for Christians. We don't want anyone, anyone having a false hope, thinking they're on their way to heaven, but they really aren't. And we don't want to preach a message that isn't biblical either. So I just admonish you, friends, with all heads up, with all eyes open, with no music playing, with the lights kept on, are you in the faith? Are you truly a Christian? Make your calling and election sure. Test yourself to see if you're really in the faith or not. 
Repent of, sh of sharing and preaching false gospels, which are really no gospels at all. And begin to share the biblical gospel message. So friend, I hope this, this video, this teaching was edifying to you. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask questions in the comments below. But get right with God today. If you're not right with God, if you are right with God, get out there, share the gospel, and share the biblical gospel so we can get this world saved so Christ can come back and, and uh, install his kingdom on earth. God bless.